to Relationships 101. I am Dr. Donna Tonry, and I am the director of the Counseling and Family Therapy Master's programs here at LaSalle. I'm very pleased to be with you today and also pleased to have Dr. Michael Sood and Dr. Dina DiNardo joining me for a conversation about relationships. Both Dr. Sood and Dr. DiNardo are licensed marriage and family therapists and they teach in our marriage and family therapy master's program. Today, we will discuss how marriage and family therapists are trained to help people deal with relationship issues and the importance of learning about healthy relationships. Welcome, Mike and Dina. To begin today's discussion, I think I would like to start with you, Mike, and if you could talk a little bit about, um, maybe have our audience understand, what do marriage and family therapists do? Yeah, Donna, so I, I think, um, one of the things that makes marriage and family therapists unique um, is that we're trained to treat relationships. Um, so um, I guess that to me that means being able to treat more than one person in the therapy space, whether that be in an office or someone's home or wherever. Um, and also understanding that there's this real intangible special thing between people mm -hmm. um, that you know, is a part of both of them, but not all of both of them, or right. more of them, mm -hmm. um, that we are kind of trained to, to work with, um, in addition to working with just individual people. So do you think people understand that when they hear that you're a marriage and family therapist? Do they think just marriage, or do they think relationships? Um, it's hard to know what everybody thinks. I, mm -hmm. I, I think some of, I, at least what I would consider misconceptions that I've heard about, um, are things like that marriage family therapists only treat people who are getting divorced, which oh. I actually think we treat very few people um, <laughs> who are getting mm -hmm. divorced. Um, mm -hmm. Usually those people are not coming for treatment in my experience, sometimes. Right. Um, but we treat um, family issues, parents and children, adult family issues like adult siblings, um, a lot of couples who are together, mm -hmm. varying you know, degrees of happiness, I guess, or togetherness. Right. Right. Um, so I think that's often a common misconception. It's not just right. splitting up couples. So it kind of sounds like people would come to you in order to not get a divorce. That would be my, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think sometimes people would want help breaking right. up or co-parenting if they split up. But often, I think, yeah, people are looking to stay together and strengthen mm -hmm. their relationships. Right. And hopefully that's what we're trained to help do. Right. Dina, yeah. I'd like to ask you a little bit about when students are coming into the program, do they begin with the understanding of what marriage and family therapists do, or do you get a sense that they learn it as they go along? I get a sense that they have curiosity, and then once they start learning the information, they realize, wow, this is how I'm thinking. This is making a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. I agree very much with Mike. They come in and they learn that we're going to treat relationships. We're going to kind of remove the problem off of the individual person and spread it out among the people that are closest to them. Right. And so I find that the students really like hearing that perspective because mm -hmm. um, it tends to reduce blame and it tends to take the pressure off of someone who's otherwise been identified as mentally ill. That's interesting. So I'm, I'm getting the sense from what you said. So someone comes into therapy. I think maybe they may walk in think thinking that there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying is they may find out that uh, possibly there's something right with them, that there may be something wrong in a relationship. Is, is that kind of in line with what you're thinking? That's exactly right. And once the students start to hear about that perspective, they become very exciting because it's different than the way mental health is practiced in the other particular disciplines of our field. Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. Um, do you find that um, as the students are going through and now they're getting closer to actually doing the work, what is their sense of working with more than one person in the room? Because mm -hmm. it sounds like from what Mike was saying, there's more than one person in the room sometimes, maybe not all the time. Sure. I think at first they find it a little intimidating mm -hmm. and they recognize that it involves building a relationship with each person in the room and they think, how will I not focus on one too much or not focus on another? How am mm -hmm. I going to balance that? How right. will I be impartial? Um, right. So that's a really great opportunity for them to learn about how to do that and that it is tough work, but the benefit is that it's very effective mm -hmm. and that once they're able to see people in the context of their relationships, they're just in a better position to help. Right, right. So Mike, coming back to you, um, if a person comes in to you for therapy sure. and they're coming in by themselves. Sure and you recognize that the issue isn't necessarily with that person but more with the relationship 
as a marriage and family therapist, how would you follow through with that? That's a great question. That happens a lot because um, mm. it's a lot of times individuals right. that come to therapy, even to MFTs. Um, right. So I, I think um, for me, I will just try and ask about some of the ways in which whatever they're describing um, affects their relationships and maybe some of the ways in which their most important relationships affect them. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it, it goes even beyond their immediate close relationships. I'm also interested in their you know, broader community, um, social and cultural mm -hmm. issues, their ways of identifying how those kinds of things contribute to the things that they're describing. Mm -hmm. um, in order for them to, uh, I guess my hope is to expand their understanding of what's going on. Right. Do and, li and like Dean was saying, to feel less blame and less like it's all them. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Do you ever invite someone that they're in relationship with into the work? Absolutely, um, and that would be something that we would talk about um, the potential benefits and consequences of doing that. Because um, right. I, I guess I believe there's consequences to every decision like mm -hmm. that, and it's you know some, hopefully that would be a good idea at least some of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and difficulties can arise from bringing other people into the process. Right. So I, I really think that that's really up to the clients. It's it's mm -hmm. their life, I mean, mm -hmm. so I, I kind of try and trust their opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but sure, I would open up that possibility to, for discussion. I right. think that Mike brings up an excellent point about expanding out to these other systems that we're thinking about. So another misconception is that marriage and family therapy only deals with people in a marriage or people within a family, but these other um, social aspects or occupational right. aspects or academic aspects, governmental, they're right. all very important and they all impact the family, which impacts right. individuals, which impacts smaller relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I think Mike brings up an excellent point by expanding the focus in what we're talking about. I would imagine someone coming into therapy feels nervous that, you know, they're opening mm -hmm. something up and they're opening up to a person that they've never met before. And I would think that if once they learn that the focus isn't going to be just on them, that the focus is much broader, that it's the relationships within maybe their family or a couple or siblings or friends, coworkers, or the community, that that would help them. I, I would think it would help them to understand and change the dynamic that it's not just about me. Is, is that something that occurs? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. I think that people feel much less weighed down, the pressure is off, and when the pressure is off, I think that it creates an opportunity for hope and the belief that things can get better because they're not so overwhelmed. Right. So obviously we're here because we're all LaSalle and we all teach in the program and we're all training marriage and family therapists. So from that perspective and in our program, what is the value that you think um, we bring to the community when we're training our students and how in the program do they learn how to do this? Do you want me to answer that first? You want to go ahead? I think one of the best parts of our program and something that the students seem to really um, take advantage of is that we do a lot of focus on the self of the therapist and so that means students coming in and not only learning about theory family therapy techniques and aspects but learning about who they are mm -hmm. what's drawn them to the field um, what about them in particular is going to make for an excellent mm -hmm. therapist and in that process they're really able to understand themselves in their own personal relationships and I think that when they get a good sense of that, they're in a much better position to begin helping people with their relationship. So I think that's one of the benefits of our program for sure. Mm -hmm. How about you, Mike? Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I just have, I completely agree with that. I just have that belief that um, who we are as people is who we are as therapists. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not much separation there. Um, yeah. So I, I don't, yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that's important in our program. And, and I think, Donna, going back to your question about how we contribute to the community, um, I, I've started this practice on orientation night where I ask the students um, what the most, uh, the incoming students, what the most important um, thing in their lives are. Right. And, and virtually everyone um, talks about their most significant relationships, whether that be their family, mm -hmm. their partners, their pets, uh, mm -hmm. you know, whoever, whoever's mm -hmm. most important. Mm -hmm. And um, I tell them, well, that's what you're going to learn to work with, um, mm -hmm. the most important things in people's lives. Right. So I, I think, you know, we, uh, what I hope is we're, you know, training therapists to do really meaningful work. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's always my hope. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know what could be more valuable, you know, in the community right. than working with, you know, what's, in, what's most important in people's lives. Mm -hmm. and, and listening to both of you talk about 
the self of the therapist. It actually sounds like, and Mike, what you were saying, the person you are and the therapist you are yeah. is congruent, it's connected. So it sounds like in the therapy in environment, you also become a person they're in relationship with. It's not a personal relationship, mm -hmm. but it sounds like the relationship with you and the client comes into the work as well. Is, is that accurate? Absolutely, and so we definitely pay close attention to the literature that suggests that the relationship is one of the most important mechanisms for change in the therapeutic relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I think the attention that we give to ourselves is as important um, to the relationships that the client's coming in to, to talk about. So now you have students in front of you, they're new to this, and then you're telling them that your relationship with the client is important. Mm -hmm. What kind of responses do you get from the students sometimes? I don't think they're really surprised. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, th I, think, I think some feel an extra pressure there, but I, I guess it's my hope that if they can just learn to be more and more of themselves, um, and not, and basically I, I imagine like what brought them to the field or brought them to the program are some of mm -hmm. the skills and you know that they have in relationships some of the things they do well already that that's probably going to be really valuable for people right. beyond these specific things that we'll teach them in class. I, I just want them to be more of themselves. So my wish is they feel less and less pressure um, mm -hmm. and you know to be something other and more and more pressure to just right. be them. Right. That makes sense. I agree. I think they come in with the initial pressure of what that means but in complete agreement again that the pressure lessens over time because it's more about getting to know your client and allowing your client to get to know relevant aspects of you and mm -hmm. so in that process there's a letting go a letting go of what do I need to do right. and a just trust that you can be yourself mm -hmm. yeah. and that's how the relationship starts right oh, and that word yeah I'm sorry obviously we all know the field well but it clearly even just sitting here and having this conversation it's really interesting how the approach is different by virtue of relationships. Is that? Do you think that's a fair statement? Yeah, I, I would say so. Would you say so? The approach to mental health practice? Yes, and I think we can come back to this when mm -hmm. we come back. Um, as you can see, there is a lot to talk about when it comes to relationships. We will take a short break, and when we come back, we'll continue with our conversation. learning how to code or make video games and websites. Not only can you post videos online, you can make your own. It's learning about leadership.
welcome back to Relationships 101. I'm your host, Dr. Donna Tonry, Director of LaSalle's Counseling and Family Therapy Master's Programs. Joining me to discuss relationships are Dr. Michael Sood and Dr. Dina Donardo. So coming back to our conversation, um, one of the things um, I realize when I speak to prospective students, they want to know what is the difference between marriage and family therapy and professional clinical counseling. There are two programs that they come into for mental health counseling or therapy. And um, I begin by explaining to them that uh, marriage and family therapy is based on systems theory. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, Mike, could you give us a little overview of what, what is systems theory? I will try. I think we do a 15, uh, full semester course on that. So uh, yes. in 15 <laughs> seconds. Um, <laughs> I, I, a short answer, I guess, is that um, systems theory is the idea that um, things, you know, interactions, first of all, um, like again, exist between things, people, um, and there are ways in which patterns and things are maintained by the way people respond to, if we just stick with people, the way people respond to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so that in any given situation, there's really shared responsibility, not necessarily equal. Mm -hmm. for how, for whatever happens. Um, so if it's mm -hmm. an argument um, or whatever, um, right. each person, you know, if it's two people, each person contributes to that. If it's more than all people contribute at some level to that. And right. it's really understanding how that works and how mm -hmm. that is, you know, what we call in our field maintained, um, mm -hmm. I guess, by, you know, through those interactions. And I imagine people are familiar with the term family system. Sure. So I would suspect that that is where the focus begins, looking at the family system. Yeah, and I think that's where the focus began, kind of the history of our field. And, and I think, like I was saying earlier, I think it, it, we've, hopefully we've expanded to also include like extended and mm -hmm. broader cultural and social systems um, right. that those things also maintain um, issues in our lives, you know, right. for better or worse. Right. Um, and so we want to look at those as well, how all those mm -hmm. things contribute to the things that you know, our clients describe, or our students describe. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I think the students come in with, a, with this idea that there's a historical background to, to the family systems work that we do, and mm -hmm. it does come from this concept of general systems theory, which has been applied to all the different sciences, the life sciences, the biological sciences, and that the marriage and family therapists came in, 50s, the 60s, and they realized, wow, these these theories of systems, how a system operates, right. parts, that can be applied to families. And mm -hmm. people can be looked at as parts of a system. And that the same communication mechanisms that exist in other systems, they exist in families as well. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's really the connection. So I'm just curious, what happens to the student that's sitting in your classroom and is learning about systems theory and is understanding that every person in the system is a contributor to what's going right and a contributor to what maybe needs to change. So what happens when the student recognizes they're part of the system too? D does that come out in the, in the classroom? I think that it does. I yeah. think that when we see the group dynamics play out within the classroom, they really recognize the way in which that's applicable. And that's a great opportunity for us as educators to be able to kind of point that out to them. Mm -hmm. And you know, you see how students develop as leaders, and then how other students develop as um, giving assistance to the the rest of the system to function better. Mm -hmm. Especially when group projects start right. to happen, right. and they develop their own system. So it's an it's an awesome teaching opportunity for us right. for them to realize their relationships that are forming mm -hmm. within the course. Can I, yeah. So I was, uh, you used this word earlier. I think you talked about hope, um, and so I, I think it's often at first for clients and for students often difficult. Um, to kind of, I don't know, to swallow or understand they, they might be contributing to whatever they're describing. Mm -hmm. And I also think that eventually, I guess my, my wish is that they move to this place of having more hope because if they're contributing in some way, then they can, they can also do something. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's all someone else or all something else, there's not a whole lot we can do. And right. so that, that always feels more hopeless to me. Right. So my, my hope is in addition to it being difficult, it's also more hopeful. Right. And it makes me think of the saying, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine students are learning that they are a contributor to whatever system they're in. But I would think it's a little bit different like with the student learning that, wow, I'm part of the system, so I am part of whatever is happening in the system. And then I was thinking back to when we talked about when the client comes in, mm -hmm. and the client comes in and finds out I'm not the problem by myself. 
So it, it, it's an interesting dynamic. On one side, I would think it does give enormous hope to the client to learn I'm not the problem by myself. And then it could be a little um, possibly intimidating for a student to learn because I would imagine when you're doing this work, you're teaching these theories, you're giving examples, and you're probably having students do work on their own family system. Mm -hmm you know, some light bulbs go off and they begin to learn things about their family system, about themselves, about how they contribute. Um, I, I can imagine that could be a little daunting for a student. It can, but I think that we provide a really good level of support because we have them writing their reaction papers and their reflection Excellent. journals and they're coming right. in and they're able to process all of that that they're taking with them and they're experiencing at home during mm -hmm. the holidays. They always mm -hmm. come back after the holidays and say, wow, I saw this and I've noticed this and then as a group, as a system, they can kind of share their experiences with each other and provide support for how they learn how to kind of manage everything that they're learning and mm -hmm. find a place for that. Hmm. Does a system form in the classroom, in a sense, when the students are learning about all of this? Does, do you see a system actually forms in the process of this? I think sometimes it does. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, especially the more we get the students involved in active activities and they're interacting with each other, right. you know, roles form, and um, so sure that right. there's relationships and patterns between them as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure, especially in the context of role playing, because mm -hmm. that's a major part of our, our um, program here is to have them be engaging in role playing. It's one mm -hmm. of the best tools that we have to, yeah. you know, simulate what it's like to be in the room with. Um, different people from a, a family system. I would think too that the, the students want to learn about other things. I mean obviously they want to learn about the systems because they're becoming a systems therapist so to speak. Um, but many times you hear that clients go into therapy because of either depression or anxiety. Mm -hmm. So if someone were to have depression or anxiety, would they go to a marriage and family therapist? Sure, absolutely. You know the thing about marriage and family therapy is um, we consider all of the different ways of conceptualizing a case, but what we really focus in on is the, the very real um, aspect that depression and anxiety often can result as a lack of balance in those important interpersonal relationships. And so when students start to conceptualize it that way and you start to make subtle shifts and the depression or the anxiety begins to improve, then the students are really excited about the work. Mm -hmm. So let's Let's talk about um, you know, the general public. Do you think that the general public would think if, they were, if someone was suffering from depression or anxiety, do you think they would think they could come to a marriage and family therapist for therapy? I don't think that that would be everyone's first inclination, mm -hmm. no. I, I don't think so, because um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, I think like you were asking about before, most people right. think of us as just dealing with relational problems, which I think we are specially trained right. to do. Right. Um, and in addition, we can work with individuals um, right. and see those problems as systemic and or relational. Yeah, right. yeah, I, I'd have to agree with Mike. Unfortunately, I think that people think to go to a primary care physician or a psychiatrist, um, and they think of it in very biological terms, very medical approach. Um, so no, I think that what we offer um, has sort of yet to be discovered by the general public. Wow. Because I go back to what you were saying, Dina, when you said that sometimes people will come in and learn that some of the depressive depression that they're experiencing is connected to their relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's a shame if someone's experiencing something active in their life that is, you know, going on that can be changed mm -hmm. and they don't know that they can come to someone to talk about relationships. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like that's something that really you know, the public needs to learn, sure. not just obviously sure. our students. Well, and that can be really scary and really intimidating and really mm -hmm. threatening because relationships are built on this basic premise that we're interdependent. And so if we think that there might be a shift in these significant relationships, then that can bring with it its own set of anxiety or sort of worry. And so the um, one of the you know great aspects about what we do is that we can really tend to what does it mean to perceive or to predict that there might be a shift in your relationship, what's scary about doing that and start to understand what, why it might be hard for people to kind of go there. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the word anxiety because um, I'll come to you, Mike. Um, I suspect it works the same with anxiety. 
So we're talking yeah. depression, but I would think it may be for quite similar if someone's experiencing anxiety. Yeah, I, I think people that ex experience anxiety often have a lot of good reasons for experiencing anxiety mm -hmm. if we talk to right. them enough. Um, right. And that there might be way, things that they're doing or ways they are um, which contribute to their struggles. And there's right. probably a lot of ways in which others are mm -hmm. and in which the systems they live in contribute to what they're struggling with. Right. Um, and I think going back to what you were saying earlier, that I, the hope is it helps to, for them to feel less blamed and responsible for all of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, have more ways of working with it, mm -hmm. and more ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of one of the reasons I wanted us to do this, um, to talk about relationships, to help people understand our program and what we do here, and also to understand the field of marriage and family therapy, that there's a uniqueness to it. Um, I think that all mental health clinicians have the same goal. They want to help people and they want to bring them to a solution or resolve issues within their lives, make changes that they want to make. But the marriage and family therapist takes a different approach. So I really appreciate you being here today and we hope you have enjoyed today's conversation on Relationships 101. You can reach us by going to our website at lasalle.edu slash gradmft or lasalle.edu slash gradcft to learn more about our programs. Thank you for watching.